Tape Projection. It's Wednesday morning, and you know what that means. It's time for an edition of the Alabama Slam Podcast. I'm Corey Hanna with my co-host Patrick Akers. Patrick, what's going on? What's going on, man? So, yeah, you know, but our listeners don't know. Uh, my wife and I just had a baby uh, last week, uh, Raylan Jade. And so I am recording right now from the closet because this is currently the only quiet place in the house. We have uh, a one-week-old, and then we have a two-and-a-half-year-old on top of that. So everything is chaotic. So, But this is what we, we do to bring it to the listeners. We do whatever we can do. So That's I'm right. in the closet right now recording. I'm amongst all my wrestling T-shirts, so it's a perfect envir- for, environment for me. Awesome. So we'll probably do the next two or three episodes this way, and then uh, we'll try to be back in person doing the podcast again. But for the next few weeks, we'll uh, we'll keep Patrick at the house with the, with the babies and baby mama and uh, – We'll, we'll just keep the show rolling when we can. So, you know, that explains a little bit why we missed Friday, but also we wanted to do a, like a special version for uh, the Double or Nothing recap. So I say let's waste no time and get on into it. Um, I purchased the pay-per-view a little late. I got home about 8 o'clock Sunday night, 8.30, and missed the first couple hours and uh, had to jump right in. For whatever reason, the Bleacher Report app will not – let me rewind or at least it wouldn't let me so uh i had to pick up yesterday morning and finish the show from the first couple of hours and uh the buy-in was not there so i missed the hook housing debut did you get to see it i did yeah actually that's the only thing i actually caught live uh when it happened uh, it was a real quick short match like five something minutes uh i mean it looks like they're gonna continue with this hook housing thing uh dan housing he's gonna be a comedy character uh i mean he pulled off a little bit more moves um during the the buy-in because you know he lost to tony niece and i don't even know like 13 seconds whatever it was didn't even get a move in so he had a couple of her and karanas um but hey the fans seem to be behind uh hook and hook and dan housing it's kind of like uh like an odd couple you know it's like if the the, the good looking kid in high school instead of bullying the the outcast like teamed up with them to take on all the other bullies so i think it's a cool concept we'll see what they do with it um one of the things that's probably going to limit hook though is just uh, he doesn't have a lot of experience right so uh that's kind of why they're they're protecting him in this kind of way but i mean if they keep beating up little tag teams here and there like this like i'm all for it and, and the fans seem to love it yeah, that was the impression I got just from reading a couple of things online and, and being on Twitter. And, I, you know, I didn't know a lot about Dan House, and I'd seen his name pop up on Twitter and things. And then right around the time that uh, everything went down with Ring of Honor last year or earlier this year, whenever that was, uh, you know, and everybody got released from their contract. Everybody assumed that Dan Housen would end up in AEW, and I started paying a little more attention to his Twitter feed and did a little research on him. And, I, you know... I'm I'm not all always a fan of the comedy characters, although Orange Cassidy is one of my favorites. But I like I like the Danhausen uh, stick, if it were, as it were, and uh, I'm all for it. Uh, I, I guess I need to find and see if I can look that up on YouTube. Surely it's somewhere on YouTube by now. Yeah, it's on their YouTube. Uh, they they posted the whole entire buy-in. I think it was actually live on YouTube is where I watched it. Okay, uh, cool. So so yeah, if you if you don't want to watch the match, all you have to watch there's a, a gif floating around. You know how Hook does his uh, where he turns his back away from his opponent, stares into the ringside camera before the match starts. Yeah, yeah. So Dan Housen like did poked his little head in and smiled and waved. So I mean that's about it. Smart Mark Sterling, uh, he's the one that ate the pinfall. Um, <laughs> he, he you know he's a comedy character in his own right. Uh, so he didn't miss much, but but we'll see where this thing goes from here. Yeah, so let's let's get into the show. Obviously, the big news for the weekend was a lot of drama surrounding MJF, and the rumors were that he had he had booked a plane out of the city and blah blah blah. And then later, people were saying that rumor wasn't true, et cetera, et cetera. So who knows what was real and what was a work? But uh, from what I heard, he did actually show up pretty much at the last minute he wasn't backstage all day he showed up at the last minute did his match and left the uh left the arena so um you know contract negotiations and all that seemed to be like 
that's what his big holdup is. And and who knows? Some of it could be still a work, but I, I do know there's contract drama there. So, uh, you know, it, it ended up being a short match, and he he put it Wardlow over like like everyone hoped he would. Uh, but there there's a lot lot more going on there, and I guess we'll we'll see how this all plays out. Man, this story just will not die, will it? Like we keep getting report after report. Uh, here here's the thing, like like I think we said last week on the podcast, if MJF is wanting to get more money but not willing to negotiate more years on the contract, that just seems absurd to me. Like that's not how any sports contract works that's any, naive it's just naive to think that yeah yeah and, and i think i saw a report today like he actually did get a raise uh if probably not here recently but sometime sometime in between dynamite's been on three years now on television he's had a raise in there somewhere um so man you know when i saw the stuff saturday start popping off i think you were actually the one that texted me because uh, of course i was i've been in baby mode for this whole week so I, I th- this story is just wild to me. Uh, kudos to him, though, for at least showing up, uh, because this is one of the longest stories still going in AEW. I mean, him and him and Wardlow was two and a half years in the making. Uh, so I think, you know, if he would have not showed up, uh, I think he would have regretted it. I, I think it would have taken a hit on his career, uh, particularly if his whole thing is he's trying to go to WWE, right? Because if you know, in Vince McMahon's mind, I'm sure he could reason it to say, hey, if he did that to those guys, like, what's to say he won't do that here? Um, right. At this point, though, I'm leaning towards it probably as a work. I, I don't... It, it wasn't in the beginning, obviously. I think this is le- legitimate. I think he actually wanted more money, and he's deserving of more money. I mean, he's one of the top guys on the roster, no doubt. Um but now that all this stuff has come out, now that he's done it, you know, obviously at the end of this Wardlow match, he looks like he's been written off TV for a little while at least. You know, they took him off on a stretcher. Right. With the oxygen. With, with the oxygen that wasn't even over the nose. So kudos <laughs> to the AEW medical team. Uh, but, you know, we'll see what comes from it. I mean, there is an opportunity here. And this is one of the things I actually wrote down in my notes. Um, you know, modern day professional wrestling really runs its narrative on two concurrent tracks. Uh, so there is the narrative that happens with the show in front of the camera, and then as then there's the narrative that gets painted with all the dirt sheets and everything like that, right? Which is a, you know, when I say modern day professional wrestling, really since the, I mean, the dirt sheets have been around really since the 80s and 90s, but with the, the, the rise of the internet here in probably the last 20 years, it's really kind of sort of taken off. Um, which is kind of interesting because even though there are two concurrent tracks that are running where you have avenues to use for storytelling, no one's really taking advantage of the dirt sheet type track, right? So if this is a work, this is sort of a genius way to go about it. Uh, <laughs> where you have, I mean, he's the only heel in wrestling that gets legitimate heat. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, you look at a guy like Roman Reigns, there's half the audience that's still cheering for him. Or a guy like Seth Rollins that's supposed to be a heel, there's half the audience that's still cheering for him. Even in AEW, there's heels that get cheered. I mean, when this dude came out, it was 95% booze? 90% booze? Yeah, yeah. Any, any of the people that were on his side before, I think, were not as of this weekend. So, so I mean, you know, if it, if it ends up being a work, I mean, that is a really interesting way to go about telling the story uh, inside the ring. So, I, I don't know. Let's hope that something comes. I, I want to see MJF stay in AEW. Uh, if he goes to WWE, you know, he's his own person. I'm sure that's been a goal of his. I think he even posted a picture on Instagram, him, like, holding a replica WWE title or something like that. <laughs> so, I mean, he knows what he's doing, too, and he's such a smart guy, man. Whatever he decides to do, he's going to be successful. But, um, yeah, I hope he doesn't go away from AEW. But, man, yeah. War- Wardlow, what a thing they have in this dude, man. I don't even care yeah. that it's a Goldberg ripoff. Like, let it be a Goldberg ripoff. This dude's awesome. The fans are completely 100% behind him. Um, and they, they spared him, too, right? Because the one problem he had couple weeks ago when he cut that promo is he's just not a very strong promo right now 
So you saw at the end of the match, when, you know, Tony Schiavone just comes out, Wardlow is all elite, and then they never give the mic to Wardlow, which is perfect. Like, he doesn't need to talk. Let him come out. Let him whip people's ass. Let him powerbomb people five, six, seven, eight, nine times, and that'd be that, you know? Yeah, I thought it was it was well done the way they handled it. You know, he was uh, just standing there and looked gracious and all that stuff. I, you know, they could have gone a bunch of different directions with it, but I was pretty happy with the way it, way it went. Uh, if you would have told me two and a half years ago this dude's going to be a star, I was like, eh, he's just going to be a, a henchman. But um, dude has definitely put in the work and has gotten over in a major way, uh, and I'm happy for it. I think it's going to be interesting to see where they go. Do they try to put a title on him, or they 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 maybe go TNT title for or TBS? What? I always forget which one they're even on these days. Uh, the TNT title, but do they try to put that on him? Or, I mean, do they wait a few months and maybe try to build him up for, you know, a match with Punk or whoever happens to be the the world champ at that point? Hey, and, you know, this big thing with Wardlow, too, you know, his rise to stardom, a lot of that's because of MJF, too. You know, yeah, every, for sure. you, you need a dance partner. You need people to, to root against. Uh, and, you know, hey, this dude is – he's made a star now. Uh, and this MJF's been a part of – with his rivalry with Punk – the best, I, what I would say, the best program in wrestling history in the last two decades. Uh, and now here, a guy, Wardlow, that they kind of plucked from obscurity. No one really knew him before uh, AEW started. And now here he is. He's getting one of the loudest reactions um, of the night. So a, a lot of that, you know, when you go to the table, if you're MJF, you go to the table with Tony Khan, like, those are things that both of those guys know. So um, yeah, we'll, sure. we'll, we'll see. This contract thing won't die, though. I'm sure we'll see. There'll be something else that'll come out, and uh, we'll talk about it here on the podcast. For sure. Well, unless you've got other thoughts on that, I say we move on to the Young Bucks and Hardys because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, Jeff Hardy's cooked, man. Yeah, he's I, he's he's hurting in a major way. Jeff Hardy uh, is – he's done. Put a fork in him. It, it is over. It's, a, it's such a shame because this dude has been – one of the more popular wrestlers in modern day, uh, but man, watching him try to get up to the top rope is—it's uh, it, bad. And kudos to the Young Bucks for really carrying the Hardys through this match. I mean, those guys, Matt and Nick, are are so talented in their own right, uh, so innovative, and they really carried the Hardys along for this. Uh, but this was a really good match, though, even with Jeff's kind of struggles. Like it felt like a fight. It felt like the, there was some animosity there. The super kicks with the Hardys on their knees, just eating them, that was awesome. Uh, but, yeah, I think the biggest takeaway from this is just, man, Jeff Jeff Hardy is not what he, not what he was, and it's a shame. But it happens to yeah. everybody. Yeah. I, I, you know, I've seen speculation that that he was already kind of hurting before, and then they had the he had the big match with uh, Darby and took that major jump off of the um, – off of the ladder from the from the you know ring to the floor or whatever, so uh, he's probably still in severe pain from that. And then you know you get put through the ringer and back by the Hardy Boys or no, excuse me by the Young Bucks uh, in a fifteen twenty minute time limit. Things are not going to feel real great the next day, and you could tell that that he was hurting, like you said, just trying to get on the top rope. I mean, even that poetry in motion, I mean, that's a move they've hit thousands of times. And it's not even that high impactful of a move. And, like, you could just see him struggling and, like, laboring. And, you know, I don't, could he be working that? Sure, but I don't think that that's it, – it doesn't look good in the type of way that you would if you were trying to work it. It looks not good in the way that, like, hey, like, he's in his 40s and he's taking crazy bump after crazy bump and his body's just breaking down on him right in front of our eyes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, he's definitely off TV for tomorrow night, or which, if you, when you're listening to this on release day, he's not on TV tonight. Um, and I would assume he will not be back in the next few weeks. At least, you gotta give gotta give that body a little bit of time to recover. And listen, I know they're probably paying him a lot of money in AEW to come over. Like I said, he's a gigantic star. But I. If this is how it's going to be going forward, I don't, I don't want to see this. I don't want to see Jeff Hardy on TV struggling like this. He's been—he's too much of a legend 
and it's gonna it's starting to get to the point where it's sad and, and I don't want it to feel that way I want to remember Jeff Hardy as you, you know the guy that's jumping off the ladders the charismatic enigma uh, the guy with the face paint and the and the the, the swanton bombs looking uh, looking beautiful as they come down he can't even do the swanton bomb the way he used to do it anymore and he's talked about that just because his lower back issues like you just can't do it anymore so uh, it's a shame um, for real yeah so. yeah well I mean overall like you know we've we've just touched on the Jeff aspect of it but it was a good match it was it was a great match yeah uh, you know I, I don't know where you know where each of those teams go next it looks like it'll probably be Matt running more of the AF Hardy family uh, HFO the Hardy family office back again for a little bit Um but, you know, what do they do next with the Young Bucks? Because clearly FTR is in the uh, is in the tag team picture, so I don't really know what they're going to do with I mean, the those, Bucks for a while. Those guys are so creative. They'll, they'll find a way. They'll find a uh, some kind of interesting storyline to go into. You know, Hangman, uh, you know, we'll get to that, but Hangman doesn't have the title anymore. Is there a, is there a reunion on that front? Yeah. Um, who knows? But yeah, this was a great match. One little minor thing I wanted to point out because it's a like a pet peeve of mine. The way Nick Jackson took the twist of fate is how you're supposed to take that move. And go back and watch it if you're listening to this, you don't know what I'm talking about. But like logically on a twist of fate, like someone's pulling your neck down, which means your head should hit at a different time than what the rest of your body does. And so many guys when they take that move they end up jumping up with the person and their entire body lands flat at one exact time. And Nick Jackson, just the way he took it, I think he took two of them. I was like, man, this is great. Like, they're so good. Like, and it's tiny things like that that make the move look way more devastating and that end up uh, helping out the way the match is end, ends up feeling and the way it gets remembered. So a little yeah. minor thing that if you, if you don't know, if, for the listeners, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and, and, and watch it and you'll see – the way he takes that move is the way to post some other people take that move. It's the same thing with like an RKO too. Like an RKO, anything where someone's a cutter type situation, your head should be landing before the rest of your body. Uh, yeah. It just makes it look cooler and makes it look more devastating. But So, I, you know, let's move on to the, the TBS championship with uh, Jay Cargill and Anna Jay. Um, probably my least favorite thing of the night. There wasn't much purpose to it, if you ask me. Um, I think you might have mentioned this last week or, uh, or maybe just in text, but there wasn't, like, really any rivalry leading up to this match. <laughs> it was just like, all of a sudden, hey, Jade Cargill needs uh, an opponent. Um, maybe we should just put Anna Jay out there and see what happens. <laughs> well, obviously now, in hindsight, looking back at the way this played out, uh, the only reason they had this match was because they wanted Athena – and Stokely Hathaway to debut at Double or Nothing. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's the only way they want to do it. I, that's cool. I don't, you could have moved this off the card. One of the things I'm sure we'll talk about, this card was, I think it clocked in at four hours and 40 minutes. That's just way too long, man. Like, by the time the, the people in the audience have been there, they've been there for like six hours. They have to, AEW, they have an embarrassment of riches. And so Tony Khan has mentioned that, he wants to make sure people get their money's worth. But, dude, it took me 12 hours to watch this thing in between doing everything. Yeah. Like, yeah. I started at 8 o'clock at night and got done at – or started at 8 o'clock in the morning got done at 8 o'clock at night. So, like, some of these matches that we'll talk about in here, like, you could have cut from the pay-per-view. What, like, why was this not on Rampage? They, yeah. they could have done this on Rampage or they could have done it on Dynamite uh, because there's nothing really to talk about with the match. Like you said, it just kind of got thrown together because they wanted the, the debut of Stokely and, and Athena. Which are two big gets, right? Athena is going to be a big get for the women's division. That's already, yeah. if AEW has a weak spot, it's in the women's division. And she brings, um, not necessarily a level of star power, uh, but maybe someone that was underutilized in WWE that can come in um, and you know maybe compete for, for one of the championships. Uh, she got a great crowd reaction. So, uh, but I mean, that is, they're in Las Vegas. Uh, that's a very smart a fan base there, so they clearly know who she is. The person that I'm most excited about out of that match is Stokely Hathaway, man. For her, I didn't even watch NXT, but I would see Malcolm Bivens' tweets and stuff like that on Reddit, and this dude just cracked me up, man. So, 
Yeah, you I, t- you mentioned him a few months ago, and we're like, this is one of the fucking funniest dudes out there. Yeah, he he yeah. So he, he and he's gonna have, you know, he's not gonna have writers scripting his promos and stuff like that. So the creativity is gonna be left up to him, I guess. From the way it looks, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I guess Mark Sterling is out as Jade Car- Cargill's manager, and we're gonna go with Stokely Hathaway. Is that? Am I reading that right? The way it pl- played out. That's the way it seemed to me. I mean, I you know. I'm not sure why she had Sterling in the first place, but uh, it seems to be the way it's going to go is with Hathaway. So that'll be cool. We'll we'll see what happens with them. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say about this match is, man, if Jade Cargill doesn't turn into a star, it's going to be nobody's fault but her own. Like, yeah. they are doing everything in their power to make this woman a crossover superstar. And I think she has some... She definitely has the potential to do it. I know she's been working with Brian Danielson in the ring. It's it's showing off, but it's still you can see some of her movements, or she's kind of thinking in the ring a little bit. Um, so hopefully she continues to to progress because I mean they are putting the rocket on this girl, and and you know it is there. She has a great look. She's a great talker. Uh, so we'll see what happens with her. Uh, but at some point you're gonna have to. We're going to need to see some improvement in the ring or else I'm afraid the fan base might kind of turn against her. Yeah. So I say let's move on into the uh, the House of Black versus the Death Triangle. Um, I, I think they're clearly wanting to do like a triples belt at some point. And uh, the, these will be two of the teams that I think will be uh, in heavy contention. Um, you know, you got the Lucha bro- Brothers and, and, and Pac. Uh, the three of those guys are, are they've had matches in the past you know and they always put on a hell of a show together I mean just the Lucha Brothers themselves put on a hell of a show but you add Pack in there and it, it steps it up even more a little bit and I know you're not a huge House of Black person but I do real st- still really like uh, Malachi uh, I'm not sure that the whole House of Black thing is working for me but uh, Buddy Buddy looks ripped I I just think they need to pull a couple things together to make that one work. But this ended up being a pretty good match overall, though, I thought. So this is cool. This might be our first disagreement ever on the podcast. I'm sold on this House of Black thing now. I, I, it, all it took was Julia Hart. I'm so glad they finally pulled the trigger on this. I don't know where this match ranked for you. This was my match of the night. Um, these guys just had amazing chemistry. Dude, I could watch these guys, these six dudes, wrestle non-stop every single week like the high spots were awesome no one was like waiting around for anything uh you know when people are doing dives sometimes the guys will just like look idiotic because they're just standing there waiting for the dude like there was none of that this was so crisp it was so impactful um pack is one of the best workers in the world the, the lucha brothers are awesome malachi has always been a great worker in the ring it's just that the character work is kind of been kind of all over the place but they it's something about they added buddy matthews something kind of changed yeah but malachi still got the fucking coolest entrance of anybody in the in the in the in the organization right now his entrance is the fucking baddest and i don't know it'd be hard to top it when those when the light goes and he moves from spot to spot that's just fucking genius in my opinion yeah, and so, like, yeah, I think I said last week I'm not really sold. Like, this week I'm changing my two, man. I'm all the way soft. And then you add Julia Hart. Like, if people haven't been seeing the work, the character work that she's been doing since they've missed her, which I think was, I think I went back and looked, was like two months ago? Like, it's this been is a while, yeah. It's a long payoff they've been doing this here. And so she has an awesome look now, and she's going to add a cool dynamic there. So, like, House of Black, man, I'm, I'm completely sold. On these dudes, this match was awesome. This was my match of the night. Um, I, I loved every second of this. It was really great. Awesome. Yeah, I I forget what the little kick is called, but one of my favorite things. It's so simple, but Pax thing where he does that quick spin and like will kick somebody in the shin. I I don't I never can remember the name of it, but it's so like the the torque on that has got to put a hurting on somebody. I mean, he's been one, like I said, he's been one of the best workers in the world for a while now. Uh, he's just never kind of gotten over that hump for for whatever reason. Uh, a lot of it this year was visa issues with the pandemic, so it kept him off TV for a long time. Um, but if you think some of the stuff he's doing 
now is crazy. Like there's YouTube highlights of his PWG J PWG days where he's not as jacked, and man, he he's pulling out some absolutely insane moves. So uh, yeah, he's one of the best tower flyers. Ray Phoenix, uh, Penta, yeah, I could keep going on. The only dude I'm not really sold on on this the the and the sixth man of this was Brody King. Uh, he's something's still not there for me clicking all the way. Um, but I mean, he doesn't have to be right when you have Malachi and, and Buddy Matthews. All right. Dude, Buddy Matthews is so good too. I mean, we could go on and on just about everything that he's the footwork, the the um, the the pacing, the his movements. Like, it's just it's so incredible, man. And it's cool to see these guys. Like, I wasn't really sold on this story. But, like, you just try – the one of the beauties of AEW is, like, you can just trot guys out there and give them 20 minutes and just tell them to go tear the house down and they can do it. And they can do this type of high-impactful stuff because they don't have to worry about doing a house show the next day or, like, their schedule is just way less than what it would be uh, for WWE. So, like, they can go all out. Um, and, it, yeah, it's just really fun to see. This was awesome. Well, I'm glad you turned the corner on House of Black. I'm still not sold on the lights out thing. Some of it gets kind of hokey. Because yeah. first of all, who is so who's controlling the lights during the match? Yeah, I don't know about all that. Like, is he, is he legitimately possessed by Satan? <laughs> or is like his cult? Does his cult stretch to like the AEW production team? Because I yeah, feel like there would have to be some like there's got to be some OSHA violations if you got cult members doing like <laughs> your your lighting and your audio or something. That's got to if it's not OSHA, it's definitely an HR complaint or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you think um, they'll push Julia in like singles competition, or would she just be a, a lackey with the House of Black? I would push her, man. I mean, the the women's division is in need of stars, so. I mean, you give everybody, I think you give everybody an equal shot and see what hits, you know, what lands with the fans. Her, everything about her, too, her facial expressions. Like, so much of wrestling, too, is, you know, when the camera pushes in on a close-up, what do you look like and how are you relating that story to the people at home? And, I mean, she's got that down pat. So, yeah. uh, and the miss, good job on the miss, too. I mean, she, she landed all of it in there. It looked awesome. Yeah, that was nice. The, sometimes, you know, we've talked about how, AEW, the director will miss a um, they'll miss a shot, but in things that they should be anticipating if they've had any sort of pre-production before. But uh, I think they kind of nailed it on that one. Oh yeah, they were right on it for that one. So I know uh, we might be going over these a little too quickly, but with it being a remote podcast and having so much ground to cover, I say let's go ahead and get into this. Uh, Samoa Joe versus Adam Cole for the men's Owen Hart Foundation Tournament uh, men's division. Um, not the way I wanted it to turn out, but I, I, I knew why. I know why they did Adam Cole. I, I was just, I was more of a Samoa Joe guy in this one, but I get it. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things we talked about when Adam Cole first debuted, he had so much momentum uh, coming from NXT, and that momentum kind of got squandered there for those first few months. I mean, he lost that last match to Orange Cassidy. He lost both matches to Hangman. Um, but, I mean, it's really a testament to his talent. Uh, the fan reaction never wavered. Like, they loved doing the Adam Cole Bay Bay on his entrance. And so maybe this is a, a clean start for Adam Cole, and we'll see what happens from here. Uh, I think he, Samoa Joe... They're probably just going to use him in Ring of Honor. Uh, I don't really see how, how you use him on the main roster. You know, he's not going to really compete for a world title, I don't think. Uh, he's not the level of star that like someone like CM Punk is that's really going to draw those kind of ratings. He's just a good hand, and he's awesome. He's been awesome for a long time. I think the thing I'm most excited about with him is that Tony Khan has the Ring of Honor library. So, like, fans... Hopefully, at some point, through some kind of streaming service, whether it's HBO Max or what have you, we'll be able to go back and look at some of those early 2000s Samoa, Samoa Joe, because that's really where modern American wrestling kind of evolved from. So, you know, his best work is behind him, uh, but it's cool that people are going to be able to have 
that to kind of look back on. But this match was awesome. Uh, these two have great chemistry. I, it surprised me if they said this was the first time these two guys have ever wrestled. I think I heard that right. Yeah, I think that I think that's what they said too, which was odd. Yeah, kind of odd. Uh, but yeah, we'll see what they do with Adam Cole here. Uh, it seems like those belts are not going to be defended. They were just ceremonial. Um, that was one of the rumors that people are floating around, like, oh, the Owen Hart winners are going to get new belts. and But, I mean, they made it pretty clear they're not going to be active titles on the roster. Uh, yeah, which is that good. would be much, too much. Yeah, it's too much. You don't want to start getting bogged down in titles. Um, so, hopefully a clean slate for Adam Cole. I, I've always I've liked the guy. There was definitely something that's been off about him since he's come to AEW. Um, but we'll see what happens going forward. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, like, I know you like Kyle O'Reilly quite a bit, but I'm not a big fan of Bobby Fish or Kyle O'Reilly. And, you know, Fish came in and tried to help out on that one or whatever. I don't know. I just think that maybe those guys should lay off for a little little bit. Yeah. Let let him do his own thing. I I get it. They're going to do the Undisputed Era and Undisputed Elite and all that, but. Yeah. Well, you could tell that Tony has big plans for Adam Cole because yeah. when they did the for- Forbidden Door announcement, like who was the guy that actually did the announcement? It was Adam Cole. Yeah. Like Tony didn't actually say a word. It just cut to the backstage and showed him. So uh, they have big plans for him, and he's still super young. I think he's in his early 30s, which is kind of odd because he's, he's been around for a while now. So, um, you know, I could see him being a world champion here. At some point down the line. I think they have that kind of ambition for him, and um, he has the talent to do it, for sure. Yeah. So next up, they had the uh, Britt Baker versus Ruby Soho for the Women's Owen Hart Foundation Tournament. Uh, and that's where I came in to, to the show. I, it was uh, They were about mid-match, I guess, when I came in. So I was in there trying to get situated and um, dealing with the Bleacher Report out, which I want to touch on later at the end of the show. Um, but what I got to see of this, I, I really enjoyed. Um, I think Ruby's one of the, the best of the women workers. Um, I mean, just my opinion. She gets around well and has got a good moves and all that. And, and uh, I like her character. Um, you know, I've expressed my dislike for Brett Baker in the past. <laughs> um, and she's gotten, she's in, in her defense she's gotten way 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 better but some of my first memories of her was these terrible terrible interactions she had with tony shivani um holding a coffee cup and there was some whole shtick about a barista or something and she was just not good could not like get two or three words out of her mouth when she was trying to cut a promo but um she's clearly improved she she you know won the title for a while and had it until Thunder Rosa took it away, but, uh, you know, I, I kind of thought the whole Owen Hart thing was just so that you could get a, you know, Cole and Britt Baker and put them over and then get that out of the way because they've both kind of made a thing about not wanting to work together uh, on TV. So uh, it was a way to have them together briefly and then move on from it, I think. Uh, so what do you think about it? So I guess Ruby Soho is the new Jay Lethal where she just gets beat. Every single time she's in a big spot, uh, has she won? She hasn't won a big match yet, has she? I do not know. No, not. I mean, obviously nothing like this. So I mean, she lost in the TBS and then she lost this. So again, some of the you know some of the booking decisions are kind of questionable. Uh, but in terms of the match, like they had really good chemistry. Uh, like you said, these are two of the best women workers on the roster. Uh, so it was good. It was, um, but I mean, that's all really kind of coming out of it. You kind of saw once they beat Tony Storm, uh, it kind of felt like the writing was on the wall, what they were going to do with the, the Owen Hart thing. So, um, uh, you know, Britt going forward, Britt's going to be fine. Ruby, I mean, hopefully the fans don't lose interest in her, you know, especially if you're a baby face. When you're a baby face wrestler, like if you just continually get beat, at some point, the fans are not going to root for you anymore because no one, no one wants to root for somebody that continually comes up short every single time. And I'm sure they'll probably tie this into some kind of storyline. You, you know, uh, they did something similar with Eddie Kingston uh, last pay-per-view with Chris Jericho about mentioning how he always came up short. So, 
they'll probably turn this into a storyline at some point. She's too talented to not hold the women's championship at some point down the line. Yeah, yeah or at least the TBS, but they're clearly not going to take that off Cardgill any for any time soon. Um, I think they'll let her keep that one, but we'll see. I don't know. I think they'll let Rosa keep the world champion for a while and then uh, probably not let her run with it for too long, but who knows at this point, really. Um, let's go on. Let's move on to the Scorpio Sky, Ethan Page and uh, Paige Van Zant versus Sammy Guevara, Frankie Kazarian, and Ty Conti. Um, this was kind of pointless for me. Uh, this should have been on the pay-per-view. They should yeah. have put this either Wednesday or Friday. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no reason for all those folks to be involved, in my opinion. Um, it was fine. It had some entertaining moments. Um, Sammy kicking the shit out of Ty Conti was pretty funny uh, when Kazarian got out of the way. Um, you know, I, overall, I'm glad to see that this was, ultimately, this served as the finale for the Scorpio versus Sammy thing that's been played out way too much lately um scorpio worked his ass off last year to get that title and it's changed hands several times let the man keep it for a little while uh you know he's at the top of his game everybody's kind of hating on sammy right now uh so it, it needed an out and this was a hard out you know because sammy can't challenge for it anymore so um to me, that was really the only point this one served, but like you said, it didn't really need to be on a four-hour and 40-minute pay-per-view. Yeah, I mean, again, similar to the Jay Cargill thing, they got this on the pay-per-view just because they want to page Van Zant on the pay-per-view, her debut, which I guess that means something to some people out there. It doesn't mean anything to, I think, probably even one of us. And I mean, she looked fine. I mean, you could tell she's never wrestled before, and it showed. Uh, but I just wrote in my notes, thank God this is over. Like, I'm just so <laughs> over this story. There are better uses for all of these people involved. Uh, and like you said, Scorpio, man, he's so talented in the ring. And like, if you look at the way FTR has kind of changed uh, here over these last few months, nothing about them that has changed storyline-wise. Like, the reason they're getting fan reactions the way they are now is just because... Tony allowed them to like go out there and put on classic matches, and the fans realized like these dudes are really awesome, so we're gonna start cheering for them. I think you could do something similar with Scorpio, yeah. like just have him go out there and put on classic matches. He can do it, man. Yeah, but, he's ripped and he he can move like, and he can cut a promo. I mean, he's got he's got everything to be a really good champion. I, I I'm I'm glad that they're they're over the Sammy thing, and I mean he'll he'll put on some really good matches. I believe too in the near future. Uh, so it's good to see him get to maybe get to show off for a little bit. I, I hope so. I mean, that TNT title needs something. It can't be, it can't be just used in uh, as a, a side piece in a, a different story. It needs to be its own main thing. Um, so yeah, I'm hopefully this is over. I pray to God. I hope we don't get this anymore, but <laughs> let these people go on and do something else. All right, I say let's move on. We got next up was the women's world championship with Thunder Rosa versus Serena Deeb. Um, you know, it was fine. I think you kind of had your uh, feelings about it on the our first episode of the podcast about why all of a sudden is Serena Deeb versus Thunder Rosa a thing. Um, it was actually a pretty good match for what it was, uh, but. I don't know that it did anything to to move the women's division along. Yeah, I mean, they just didn't really have a story going into this. I mean, essentially, it was just, hey, you got you you could tell what the booking was, right? Like, hey, you you're two good workers. We need the women's title to be defended on the pay per view. Like, go out there and give us a good fifteen minutes. And it, for their credit, it was a really good match. Uh, I would say it's one of Thunder Rose's better matches. Uh, I think it was better than the cage match she had with Britt where she actually won the title. Um, and I think part of that is because Serena Deeb is really good in her own right in the ring. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Thunder Rosa, like if they're going to treat this women's championship like a big deal, it needs to be treated like a big deal. She doesn't just need to be on TV once a month in a promo where she kind of stumbles her way through it. Like she should be out there defending it uh, on a regular basis. So, Hopefully this is, you know, now that 
you know, AEW only has a couple of pay-per-views a year, so hopefully everybody kind of resets after this, and we actually see Thunder Rosa get used in uh, perhaps a better way. I don't know who her next opponent would probably be. Uh, obviously, you're not going to run the Britt Baker thing back again, so um, it'll be interesting to see uh, on Dynamite coming up uh, what the future of that title looks like. Yeah. Um, I, I say yeah, let's move on because we've got I know I've got some thoughts on this next one I'm sure you do as well the uh, Jericho Appreciation Society versus Kingston Santana and Ortiz Brian Danielson and Moxley for the uh, anarchy in the arena um, <clears throat> this shit was wild <laughs> <laughs> plain and simple at first i was like somebody fell asleep at the audio board because wild thing just kept playing over and over again and then finally i was like oh wait this is fucking genius because it's just chaos out there and they were all over the fucking place and having that music on top of it just kind of made it um you know i i, I loved it even though I I think the Jericho Appreciation Society is stupid, um, I really I, w- I wish he would quit putting together these factions. I mean I get it he's building some people up, but like I don't have anything for this new faction that he's put together. I I'd say stick with that wizard gimmick and roll on with that for a while and 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 see what happens. But um, my main takeaway and the thing that I didn't like about it was that the Jericho Appreciation Society won. Like, what, what was the fucking point of that? The match was fantastic, and it was as insane as you would want something like that to be. If it's called Anarchy in the Arena, it needs to be fucking Anarchy, and it was. So they delivered on that. But why, what, what was the point of the Jericho Appreciation Society winning when all they've done is built up the Blackpool Combat Club in the last couple months? Well, I think they kind of booked themselves so that they could give themselves an out, right? Because uh, it looked like Danielson and Moxley were going to win, uh, and then Eddie Kingston comes down looking like the dude from the Grand Theft Auto loading screen <laughs> with the damn gas canister. Yeah, I mean, that was what? Wild. Yeah, bro, what an awesome thing! And then he starts pouring gasoline all over him, and so Danielson and him get into it. So, you, you know, you booked it to where you could say, you know, the the JAS are an actual unit; they're a team; they have cohesion. This uh, this team, Blackpool Combat Club, Santana Ortiz, Kingston, was just kind of thrown together. So, you know, you built up that they're going to have uh, some wires get crossed there. Um, but, yeah, like you said, this thing was wild. And it served a really good spot on the card, too, because it woke the crowd up. Uh, like we mentioned. Yeah, because pa- everybody's fucking tired. Yeah, this pay-per-view is so damn long, man. And so <laughs> they just were like, hey, we're going to fucking play wild thing. Uh, th- did they play it three times? I don't even remember. I lost count. I mean, at least. At least. And then uh, we're just going to have these guys go all over the place and, and brawl and, uh, you know, shades of the Tupelo concession stand brawl, which I know Eddie's talked about it before. I know Jericho. He's a student of pro wrestling history, so he knows. Just just wild. Uh, I'm not really for these kind of matches. You know, it did nothing uh, for me really uh but it, that type of match would be better if you were there in the arena right oh yeah 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 for sure like if you were there in the crowd and all of a sudden here comes matt menard and eddie kingston just brawling uh you know it's really it'd be really awesome cool shot on your cell phone i'm sure some people got some really awesome selfies <laughs> with some stuff going on in the background um i did think one one little detail that i loved was that when they made their way back to the sound area and Jericho <laughs> grabbed the little, I guess it was the player that was playing the um, the music or he figured out one way to disrupt it was he was the one that was uh, in charge of making sure that the music stopped, you know, because he grabbed the little box and slammed it down yeah. and that's when Wild Thing cut off. I thought that was a pretty nice touch. Yeah. You Refresh my memory, was Matt Menard there at the end shot with the JAS when they all won? I don't, I don't think he was. I could Did be Eddie wrong. Kingston kill him in the elevator? No, he tweeted out. Um, okay, so he's alive. It's, it was something about but terrible things happened to both of us in that elevator or something like that. And he was like, only the two of us know what happened or 
<laughs> some shit like that. Uh, I mean, that was an uh, awesome shot where it was just a, the two guys were just standing there in the elevator watching <laughs> Eddie Kingston and Matt Menard just brawl to the death, and then the door just closes and then down they go. Uh, and then yeah, that shot. Somebody posted on Reddit a shot that they had of Eddie. Oh, he's just in that white Yankee shirt with just blood everywhere. Like, that'll yeah. make for a cool T-shirt going yeah. forward. I think he said something about like that was my blood on on his shirt, or that wasn't all my blood. I don't know what he said. I was I remember yeah. seeing it and being like, okay, well they at least had some sort of resolution to that. Uh, but yeah, that was that was right about the time that uh, we don't have a lot of Twitter followers yet, you know, because we just started. But I, I made a couple of tweets, and one of them was. Uh, on our show, we stand Eddie Kingston. Uh, I know both of us are, are Team Eddie all the way. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, are, are in for whatever he's bringing always. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and we'll get to this here shortly, but uh, if CM Punk's title reign doesn't end at the hand of Eddie Kingston, I'm going to be fucking pissed. <laughs> but we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've got any more thoughts on the, the, the anarchy in the arena. Do you? No, I don't have anything. Okay. I want to see a, I want to see a director's cut. Like like put it on YouTube where it's all cut up with all the I'm sure we missed some moments just you know for the you talked about the AEW production team like having a live direct that thing where you got oh, that would, four different that dudes would, splitting off like Yeah, I mean I thought they did a good a good job of that one, you know, and, and there's no way to do a really good job of directing one like that where you've got everybody everywhere. I'm just talking about like every once in a while AEW will totally miss somebody off the top rope yeah and you know it you know it's happening you yeah. can see it coming and, and somehow the director will miss it but yeah um yeah I, upload I mean, them knows? individually to youtube uh, upload the brian danielson uh, uh angelo camera upload the kingston menard camera upload the moxley camera like i want to see what was going on because they brawled literally throughout the entire arena so show me what was happening all of it i think that'd be kind of cool yeah when, when um the uh first live wrestling event i went to a few years ago i went to a a smackdown taping in birmingham and uh aj styles and um daniel bryan at the time were in a, a feud and uh they ended up out by the uh, concession stand slash uh t-shirt table um out in the concourse not concourse whatever you call it the, the hallway and uh, Danielson had on like a hoodie walking through the crowd or whatever, and they ended up scrapping. And uh, there were shades of that, obviously, like you said, in the Tupelo thing. Um, so it was funny to see that come back around. Yeah, and if people have never seen the Tupelo concession stand brawl, it's on YouTube. Look it up. <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> yeah. Well, I say let's move on. We've got uh, one more, it looks like, before we get to Punk and, and Paige. We had the... Uh, Tag Team Championship, Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus versus Team Taz um, versus Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland. Um, that was pretty entertaining. Um, I mean, I'm going to be real honest. I like Jungle Boy. Uh, I, I like Luchasaurus. Luchasaurus, when he botches, botches pretty bad, but when he hits, he hits real fucking hard. Um it's just hard to see. <laughs> it's hard to see them with belts when you know the FTR is on such a fucking run right now. Um, but this match was fun. I thought um, some highs and lows. Uh, Swerve is still impressive as hell, and seeing Keith Lee go over the top is always going to be entertaining. Uh, you know, I, I don't know where else you go with Starks and uh, Hobbs. I don't know that they need to keep tag teaming because Starks is pretty damn good by himself, and and, and Hobbs has turned from an overweight guy when he came into the the division to he's just ripped as hell and out there showing out these days. I just don't know that there's any reason to keep them together as a tag team. Um, but yeah, I mean, what were your thoughts on this one? So yeah, like you said, like. I love Ricky Starks, man. I love him so much. He's so entertaining. Um, but yeah, this was kind of like you know Keith Lee and Swerve kind of just got thrown together. But uh, you know they have chemistry as a tag team. But do they keep tag teaming going forward? Because Swerve took the pin, right? If I'm not mistaken, he was the one that got beat. But that sounds right. I, yeah. I think he's the one that took the finisher. So you know, at some point, 
this tag team division, like you mentioned, like the clear stars of it are FTR and the Young Bucks, or even like House of Black. Like I think last time on the podcast I mentioned that like this this three way of Jurassic, Hobbs and Starks, and um, Swerve. It's Swerve for the Glory. I think is their new team name, which is kind of cool. I thought yeah. they, I thought it could kind of steal the show, but it turns out it was the Death Triangle and House of Black match that I didn't care for. They ended up stealing the show for me. So I think that's kind of you know coming off the House of Black Death Triangle match. This one felt kind of a little flat. Um, so you know Jurassic Express gets the win. <sighs> Jungle Boy's good. I like him. I'm not a fan of Luchasaurus. I think the mask is stupid. He should <laughs> get rid of it. Like, and even Jungle Boy like needs. We got to do something different with the ring gear, I think. And, you know, your mileage is probably going to vary on that. Some people out there might like it. I think he's too talented of a wrestler to be treated with that kind of gimmick, personally. Um, yeah. But we'll see what happens with Jurassic Express. You got to think at some point, though, probably at the next pay per view, they're dropping those titles. I don't see how they they hold on to them until the end of the year. Yeah. Jungle Boy Jack Perry, as JR would say. JR's trying so bad. Every time, every time Jungle Boy's up there, it's like Jr. is like, "Oh man, he's been hitting the gym. He's been hitting the gym, the upper Jungle body." Jungle Boy Jack was the uh, the friends meme from a few weeks ago. Where it was like, you know, repeat after me. He's like Jungle, and it showed Jr. Jungle, it's Jungle Boy, Jungle Boy, and then it was like Jungle Boy Jack Perry. Oh yeah, it's so, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He can't stop, won't stop on that one. Because he knows, man. JR's been around. He knows that, like, this, the, the dude can't be Jungle Boy when he's 35, you know? <laughs> you got to do something. So might as well, yeah. you got to educate the people now. Yeah. Well, I say I say, let's move on to the main event. Um, Punk and Hangman Adam Page. Uh, I think we all saw it coming. I'm still a little sad about seeing Hangman lose the strap. Uh, I really liked his story and his art leading up to him getting to win and um i'm not sure that he had the glorious run that he deserved um i felt like they were kind of floundering with the direction on him the last few months but uh i was really glad when he was able to get the belt uh and i wish they could have done i wish they would have done a little more with this run is all i'm i'm trying to say i guess but um yeah, you can't. It's not his fault though, right? Like you said, in terms of like actual match quality wise, you know, he has the match with Omega. He has the two matches with Brian Danielson. He has the awesome Texas Death Match that had no reason to be that good, but ended up being awesome with Lance Archer. Uh, he yeah. had a good match with Dante Martin. The the two matches with Adam Cole. Like, in terms of the match quality wise, his run has probably been the best of the four champions, I would say. I mean, him and Kitty Omega, 1A, 1B. Uh, but in terms of the actual stories that they told with Hangman, I, I feel like they kind of botched this. Yeah. Um, and even something I wrote down in my notes was that, <clears throat> you know, this this Hangman Punk thing only really started happening a couple of weeks ago. Well, it's been two months since the last pay-per-view where we could have been telling the story. And one of the things that Excalibur said... Uh, when Hangman was coming down to the ring, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, he said Hangman is an AEW original, and he feels like he needs to defend AEW from CM Punk, and CM Punk feels like he is a man on a mission to help take AEW to new heights. Well, that's a hell of an interesting story if we would have told it two months ago, <laughs> and not a week before the pay-per-view, where you have yeah. Hangman give out the the hangman does the promo where he says he needs to feel like he's defending AEW from CM Punk. So like let's let's draw that out then like I, we did such a good job long-term storytelling wise with Hangman. You know, he's in the first matchup against Chris Jericho uh for the first ever AEW World Championship ends up falling short and he goes through this entire run for 3 years until he gets the belt. Like that's an awesome story and then we just kind of did nothing with it. Uh, yeah. it, it it's sort of disappointing now. It's probably not going to be the last time that he holds the strap. Uh, I would imagine he's a star. He's going to be one of the big pillars of the company going forward. He'll probably have multiple title reigns. But like, man, what kind of a wasted opportunity we did here? I think we could have 
there was really something special that they could have done here. The, all the potential in the world was there, and it kind of feels like they just botched it. Yeah, and, you know, Punk has already said, like, he's named a list of people that he wanted to to defend against, and he obviously wants to try to put over some of the young talent. Um, but Danielson was one of the people that he mentioned he'd like to defend against, which would be pretty badass. But they're not they're not going to do that immediately. I think they'll let Punk defend against some – so maybe some up and comers, and then they'll put him against somebody that's been around for a while, and uh, maybe give him a real challenge. I just, I don't know if they're going to let Punk do exactly what Punk wants to do or or what. I I don't know exactly where they're going to take it. And this match, the only the match was really good. Uh, you know, Punk kind of botched a couple of the buckshot lariats. Uh, t- that moves a little bit harder than than what it seems to kind of get that full rotation around. Um, so he kind of botched that, and then the morality choice at the end. I've just I've seen that way too much. There was a better way to do that, with Hangman staring at the belt. Like, am I going to hit him? Am I not going to hit him? Like, I don't know, man. That seems like it's just such a cliched way to to get to that. Um, but I mean, the match was good, and and like you said, now we get Punk. We'll have a, another summer of Punk run here coming up. And I get why you want to put the belt on Punk. I mean, he's a big time star. Uh, you're hoping it helps boost your boost the ratings for Dynamite and Rampage, and it adds a, a another layer of legit legitimacy to that title. Um, you know, maybe they'll run this back here, and I don't even know how long Punk's going to stay there. Which, you know, is Punk going to be in AEW for another two years? Like, probably not, but. I mean, do they immediately move? I guess they immediately move forward. They don't do rematches in AEW that much, so um, not that often. I mean, we you know you get them every once in a while, but not like main events like this. Like you know, we obviously had a couple of uh, when Punk and MGF had a couple of matches, and then Page and Danielson had a couple of matches. Um, but I don't think. I don't think Paige will turn around and immediately get a, a shot to re-challenge. Yeah, and like you said, you know, Punk, you know, they have a, a long list of challengers they can throw at him. Um, you know, I guess the question's going to be, does he stay a babyface or does he turn heel? Um, so we'll see what they decide to do there. Uh, in terms of Hangman, I, I don't know where really he goes from here. Uh, maybe... I could see him taking the TNT title, being the first ever Grand Slam champion in the company. Uh, that could be yeah. a, that could be a thing you do. Um, so, uh, like like we said, the, these pay per views are a way for them to reset, and so this is a a big resetting for AEW. And you know, Punk's got the strap, and I'm sure if he's got some ideas of what he wants to do with it, and if it's anything like what the the MJF rivalry was, then what we should be in for some good professional wrestling going forward. Yeah. Um, again, yeah, got, again, Eddie Kingston, Eddie Kingston. That's just it. Eddie Kingston has to win this title from CM Punk. If I get one thing in pro wrestling, that might be what I wish for for my birthday. <laughs> Can we hook? Does Conrad Thompson have an end with Tony Khan? T- Conrad is a Huntsville dude. Can we get word through Conrad to Tony Khan about? Letting Ada Kingston win the title at some point from CM Punk. I'm sure he's got his number. He, uh, Conrad was at the the big announcement when they announced that AEW was a thing in the first place. He was one of the guys there when they made the big world announcement. I mean, this has to be where they're going, right? Eddie Eddie tweeted out a couple of days ago like "fuck CM Punk" for some kind of thing because FTR was like singing Punk's praises. Punk continually runs this guy down in his promos for like no reason after the rivalry. They did one match and that was it. The promo for it was awesome. There's so much money to be made with Punk and Kingston. And just selfishly, I, I want to see it happen. Make it happen. Conrad, Never if you're cr- listening, hit us up. We'll try to we'll, <laughs> we'll send a strongly worded email. You can forward it to TK, and we'll make this happen. <laughs> It never it never crossed my mind that they would put Kingston in it for it. But it, it all makes sense. I mean, when you really think about it. It's right there, man. It's there for the taking if you want it. You don't have to do it soon. You let Punk have it for a few months here. 
But the guy that has to take it from him, in my opinion, is Eddie Kingston. Because who else is it going to be? I mean, I don't think you don't do Wardlow at this point. Like, let let Wardlow win some kind of other title, and like, is it Adam Cole? Like, I, I don't know, maybe possibly, but it's just there. It's their man for Eddie. Yeah. Hmm. There have been worse ideas for sure. Uh, and you know, I'm Team Eddie. This is a Team uh, Eddie podcast. This is a Team Eddie podcast. I think you're right. All the way. Uh, so overall thoughts. What, what, how would you rank? Would Would you rank the show overall? You know, I give it. A, I think I would give it a solid B plus, A minus. It wasn't as good as the last pay per view. Um, but again, just like uh, the biggest difference for me, and we're probably going to get accused of being, you know, AEW stands here. But like, the difference between AEW and WWE is that the wrestling matches actually matter in AEW. Which is probably why every match gets 15 to 20 minutes, right? Like, I, I didn't look at the run times here for these matches. I would assume that probably every one of these matches, maybe outside the Jade Cargill and a J match, went over probably 12 minutes. Yeah, every match got probably 15 to 20. Like, they, yeah. they put on a super stack car of wrestling. So if you like, you know, the actual what happens in between the ropes, like I do, then, I mean, AEW is the place where it's at, man. But they have to get these run times down. We can't keep going for uh, four and a half hours, man. It's just too much. It's way too much. Yeah. Yeah, I'd probably go B, B minus. And, and the only reason it wouldn't be higher than that would be because of a couple of matches that I've mentioned where I was just like, what was the point of this being on a pay-per-view? Um, and the fact that it was f- damn near five hours. If we didn't have a holiday on Monday, you can't put a four and a half, four and four, four hour and forty five minute show on a Sunday night that starts at seven o'clock. You just can't do that and expect people to watch the whole thing, um, or at least at least not old ass people like me that go to bed at a decent hour these days. Um, you know, I think they could they could pull some of those matches. Uh, you know, put. Uh, People need more of a reason to watch Rampage on Friday night. So last, the Rampage before the show on Friday night was pretty fucking good. It was the best Rampage they'd had in a while. Um, I think I texted you and was like, yo, this is probably the best Rampage they've, they've had in a couple months. Um, but yeah, I think they got to shorten it up a little bit. And they got to do something about their fucking Bleacher Report app uh, deal. Because I'm running on Fire Stick and it's just garbage. I thought maybe they would have improved it since the last one, and I can't watch any more than about 20 seconds before it freezes up for a second or two and then it starts playing again. So I guess I'm buying a fucking Roku just to watch uh, the pay-per-views on moving forward. Yeah, I saw a lot of people complaining about the Bleacher Report app. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. We 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 still don't know. You know, I guess one of the big pieces of news coming out, maybe people have heard, uh, so some Warner Media, I think it's Warner Media Discovery now, or Discovery Warner Media, whatever the company's called now, uh, they have some high executives that are going to be in town for Dynamite because they're in the Los, the Cal- Los Angeles area. So they're supposed nice. to be throwing a huge party for AEW and like the executives are going to be there to kind of get a feel for the audience and that kind of stuff. So are we going to see it? perhaps move to HBO Max at some point in the future. I think that would be better. Uh, but yeah, these I haven't had a problem with the Bleacher Report app, uh, but I know it's been a thing for fans out there for sure. Yeah, it was Fire Stick fans. I think uh, after the last one, I did a little search on Twitter and it seemed to be a Fire Stick compatibility issue. Um, so I gotta get that shit resolved before next time, but um I say let's get let's go ahead and get it wrapped up so you can get back in the, in there to the baby. But first, uh, tell me what's done up real good for you this week, man. Oh man, okay. So I'm like way behind on pop culture. So I just finished the o- Ozark. Uh, it was good. Uh, I would you know if I had to give it a grade scale, you know like a, a B minus, I guess would be that. Uh, and I'm also just now starting the first episode of this newest season of Better Call Saul which may be a little bit of a hot take here Better Call Saul is a better show top to bottom than Breaking Bad 
I'll say it. I'll go out on the wire. It's not going to be remembered the way Breaking Bad is. But in terms of just the writing, the attention to detail, everything about it, Better Call Saul is a better show. And Some of the cinematography and, and directing on that show, um, I'm way behind on it. I need to get caught up. But when I was in the thick of watching it, I had similar thoughts. I didn't know if it was better overall, but some of the cinematography and, and editing and directing on it were just fucking fantastic. Yeah, and the uh, you know, last time I think my done up real good was the Harry Styles album. I talked about how excited I was. It's really awesome. So if you haven't listened to it, go listen to it. Uh, <laughs> at some point, I guess we'll have to talk to Blaine. Maybe we can just do an, a Harry Styles podcast in its own right where we just talk about everything that's going on in his life uh i'll host it uh because that dude is he's the best pop star going right now he's this generation's david bowie if you don't believe that it's just because you have your own sort of whatever because he was in one direction so you have some kind of bias there uh this dude's incredible the album's incredible go listen to it top to bottom it's awesome I know you've tried to push that on me before you were on paternity leave in the car once or twice, and uh, you might have to get my wife on that podcast if you decide to make that into fruition. So uh, this is a Team Eddie Kingston podcast. This is a Team Harry Styles podcast. And if at some point their paths ever cross down the line, we might have to do like an emergency episode to just talk about (laughs) it because it's going to set the world on fire. So. I don't know if you'll ever see a crossover between Eddie Kingston and Harry Styles. You, we we got to hope. Again, let's <laughs> we'll get Conrad Thompson's email. We'll put that. We'll do that as a little PS. Try to get something with Harry Styles. Some little promotional. Get him out there. We can make it happen. <laughs> if there's a will, there's a way. So I'll I'll say that my done up real good for this week is the drive by truckers. Um, was a huge 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 fan of the truckers. Um, back in the day, I first discovered them in 2002. Um, a few months after the Southern Rock o- Southern Rock Opera came out, um, I had seen their CDs in stores around the Shoals area where I lived and uh, grew up, and um, I knew some people that were friends with them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I had never listened to them, and then was at a friend's place one night listening to Southern Rock Opera. Uh, kind of changed my life, honestly. Changed the way I looked at the South and and the way I viewed it, and. Uh, the way I viewed Alabama. Um, and, uh, anyway, I was I was big into them for years and years, and then I kind of got away from them the last few years. But um, they put out a single about a month ago called Welcome to Club 13 that'll be on their next record. And I uh, spent a few hours one Saturday driving to Atlanta and back with a friend and um, listened to Drive by Truckers the entire way and just sang my ass off. Um and have rediscovered my love for them recently, and I'm uh, super excited about their new record, and I hope it's a fucking banger. Um, everything that I've read about what they've said about it is that it's kind of a return to the songs about, um, you know, Alabama shit and crazy shit and uh, all of that, so I'm here for it. Um, if you don't know what Club 13 is or was, it was a a shithole bar uh, just across the river in Sheffield, Alabama, across the river from Florence. Um, I was in a band in high school that played there underage, and at the time, you know, people like Adam's House Cat, which was Patterson Hood and Mike Cooley's band, were playing there, and um, it was about one of the only places you could probably go and play if you were in a band at the time, and they would do penny beers on, like, Wednesday nights or something like that. It was ridiculous. Um but by the time I was old enough to actually go there, they they shut down not that long afterward. Uh, so anyway, um, super excited about that record, and um, we'll get you back to the baby. Let's do a little bit of uh, housework, and wrap things up. Um, for if if you're if you dig what we're doing, we've got shirts available. Go to tpublic.com. You can search Alabama Take. Uh, we're part of the Alabama Take Network. Um, Blaine Duncan and a bunch of his buddies formed the take years ago in college, and he he revamped the site a few years ago and um, basically trying to create a little network of podcasts and writers and, and people that all have common interests. And, and Blaine's got a, a pop culture podcast called Taking It Down um, with a couple of his buddies, and then there's another show called This Song Sucks, 
And um, so you can get shirts for any of those shows. You can get shirts for the Alabama Take site in general, and you can get shirts that say done up real good. Or if you don't want a T-shirt, you can get mugs and stickers and all kinds of shit over there. Um, and also make sure you follow us on Instagram. We're at, at Alabama Slam Pod. And the same thing on Twitter. We're out there um, just trying to build those up. So follow us there if you can. And uh, be sure to like and subscribe uh, on your favorite podcast app. And leave a review. I think we're supposed to tell you that uh, leaving reviews is very helpful in um, getting our name in front of eyeballs of other people and their ear holes. Uh, so I guess that's it, man, unless you've got, got anything else you want to touch on for this week, Patrick. I think I don't have anything, man. Uh, we're gearing up some some good AEW stuff going forward, so I'm excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see the show um, Wednesday and Friday. I say for your sake and for the baby's sake, we'll we'll, we'll record again next Thursday. So this, this show that's uh, going to be out on Wednesday will be our one show for the week, and then we'll, we'll go back to trying to release on Fridays moving forward. Um, and uh, we'll go back to recording in person in a few weeks and and uh, see how things go, man. But congrats on your baby. Hope, uh, hope you all are doing well. Hope Holden's hanging in there and taking care of baby sister. He's doing pretty good, man. I'm running on coffee and a couple hours of sleep, so I'm going to drink another cup and <laughs> try to get some sleep. I think uh, last night I might have went to bed at maybe 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. So, uh, But I have no four-and-a-half-hour AEW pay-per-views that I have to try to watch before the podcast. So I think we're going to dig in on Stranger Things, and that's going to be the thing moving forward. I also done up real awesome. good. New Stranger Things is out. Go watch it. Sweet. Awesome. Well, thanks, y'all, for listening to us. Tell your friends and all that shit, and uh, we'll see you back next week. Good pod, Corey.